Hello. Hi, Ian. Fred is not here evidently yet. So how did year three go with your research? Did uh, it work out well? I think year three was my best collection year. Good. Very good. Look forward to hearing your talk tonight. I look forward to giving it too. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So how's college going? Uh, it's going pretty well. Uh, I'm enjoying it. Are you in person or virtual? Um, right now I'm virtual, but I've kind of just been virtual the entire time. Mm -hmm. Is it uh, ended up fitting with uh, my schedule more than in person? Are you taking any fun courses? <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's fine. I am enjoying uh, Chemistry 102 right now. I think ah. that's the most fun. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Ed. Fred, you there? I'm here. I'm here. I hear you. OK, thank you. Fly around the, would fly around the bottom again and distribute the grains of pollen on its body uh, into the, to the female flowers, effectively pollinating the plant. It would then die because the female plant also lacks the exit hole that the male has. And so Jack in the Pulpit is a perennial plant, which means it dies back every winter and then shoots up the next uh, spring. It has two methods of reproduction. It can reproduce asexually by cloning itself in which the corm shoots off a little cormlet that is genetically the same as its parent plant. And it can reproduce sexually through cross-pollination. And clones cannot cross-pollinate with other clones of the same parent plant or the parent plant itself because they are genetically the same. And Jack in the pulpit also can change gender from year to year. It, it starts out as a plant with no inflorescence, meaning it is asexual. And then as the plant grows larger and the corm can store more energy and it can produce more energy, the plant will finally shoot up some flowers and it, those flowers will always start off as male. And this is because the female reproductive organs require too much energy for the plant to initially shoot up. And so the male plant will then grow bigger and its corn will be able to store more energy. And then it will be a female plant once it can store enough energy to produce female reproductive organs. Uh, its gender is determined each year by the amount of stored carbohydrates in the corn. And as I mentioned earlier, a few plants can have both male and female flowers. But even if they do have both male and female flowers, only one sex will properly function. 
And what makes Jack in the Pulpit particularly unique among arums is that a female plant can actually revert back to a male plant. And this, is caused, this can be caused by environmental stressors, uh, lack of nutrients, and uh, physical distress as well. And so I collected around the bloom time, which is around April through June. And in 2018, due to the very many rain events we had, I was not able to collect af much after May. And in 2018 and years after, I did make observations after May. And even though the bloom time is around April through June, the prime collecting time is going to be April through May. And this is because the blooms only last around two to five weeks. And since most of them come up in early to mid April, you'll really only be collecting straggler or collecting from stragglers in uh, June. And so here's a map of my four initial collection sites, which all ended up being in different, different physiographic regions unintentionally with Cunningham Falls being in the Blue Ridge physiographic region, Mount Briar being in Ridge and Valley, Treville being in Piedmont and Beltsville being in Coastal Plains. And after my first year, I dropped three of these sites due to logistical reasons. And this is mainly because uh, besides Mount Briar, every site was over 30 minutes from my house and collecting from four different sites is a lot harder to yeah, make conclusive or gather conclusive evidence because each site is different on its own. And then taking the time to travel to each site will take even more time out. And so I ended up just sticking with Mount Briar uh, for the remainder of the collection. And the data I did collect during the first year from the other three sites was not included in the results for the study. And only the data from Mount Briar in the first year was included. And so here's an image of Cunningham Falls, which it just uh, showcases good habitat. And the ferns in the foreground are cinnamon ferns, which are known, or which are wetland plants. The in the middle of the image, there's a colony of skunk cabbage, which, as I mentioned earlier, also wetland plants. And in this image, Jack in the pulpit would probably be growing around these cinnamon ferns or back where I am. And this is because even though Jack in the pulpit grows in wetlands and also places that have rich moist soils, it doesn't really like these places that are inundated with water in the wetlands, which is kind of an oxymoron. And so you'd find Jack in the pulpit kind of growing a little bit farther from the edge of skunk cabbage, where it's a little bit drier and where there's uh, better drainage. And it's hard to tell in this image, but this is a mature forest ecosystem as well. <clears throat> and here's an image of Treville, which there's a gently sloping hill here, which leads into this depression. And this depression has a will pool water, which is why the there's a colony of skunk cabbage here. And again, you'd find Jack in the pulpit growing along the edge of the skunk cabbage. Here's an image of Beltsville where I found Dr. Damsky in the woods, as well as this cool basketball. Uh, again, it's just good habitat. There's skunk cabbage growing everywhere. And, and in, interestingly enough, this is, because this is in the coastal plains physiographic region, which is known for being very flat, this site is uh, very flat. And I just thought that was pretty interesting. And so here is the same image of Mount Briar from the distribution slide. And in the background, there's a colony of skunk cabbage. There's this pool of water here. There's service berry blooming. It's just kind of hard to see. There's a lot of moss everywhere. Some of the trees have slightly buttressed roots. And generally, this, is, this site is just a giant wetland. And the main trees that you'd find here are oaks and maples with the understory consisting of things like spice bush and service berry. And this, is, this image was also taken early spring, but this is in my last year of collection where not much was really coming up except for the wetland grasses and a few early jack in the pulpit plants. And as you can tell by my attire, it was very cold at this time. But just three days later, more plants started to come up and there's just a lot more greenery in general with the wetland grasses in the back really starting to come up more. And the Jack, there's uh, even small clusters of Jack in the pulpit plants really coming up. And Jack in the pulpit actually shoots its spathe up before the leaves. As you can see, this one that has a perfectly erect spathe with these droopy, sickly looking leaves. But the leaves just take a little while to fill in. 
And so you can kind of see it in the oldest member of this cluster on the far left over here, where the leaves are a lot more filled in. So that's just how you can kind of tell it's the uh, oldest member. <clears throat> and so these are three more images from the same day. On the left is me collecting from a Jack in the Pulpit spathe. The middle is of me is of a Jack in the Pulpit from the side. And on the right is another close up of a Jack in the Pulpit with me in the background. And again, all of these uh, Jack in the pulpits here are have are pretty recently come up, as you can tell by the leaves. <laughs> Here's an image from May 2nd, where everything has really started to leaf out now. The canopy is a lot more leafed out. And all the wetland glass grasses are really coming in. There's a bunch of jewelweed sprouts down here. And it, though it's really hard to see, there are Jack in the pulpit plants along the edge of the boardwalk. And the image on the left here shows is actually the same skunk cabbage colony from the first picture of Mount Briar I showed with uh, a gently sloping hill leading into this depression, which pools water, which is why you have all this uh, skunk cabbage growing there. On the right is service berry in fruit. And finally, this is just an image of the center of Mount Briar, which is pretty much always inundated with water. And you really wouldn't see Jack in the pole, any Jack in the pulpit's like growing anywhere in here, but they do like to grow on places that are kind of drier, like the median over here that's in between the inundated parts of the wetland. And so my general procedure for this project was to, I would sneak up on the plant to observe the outside. And this was important because there were some observations of an undescribed species of aphids on that, uh, we're using the plant and I was looking for those and I did actually collect some from the outside of the plant as well. And then I would dip a brush in alcohol or water. I tried to use water as much as possible when I was collecting because I was afraid that alcohol may or might have disrupted the insect visitation patterns, especially if it lingered in a place like the spathe. And the paintbrush I did use was a size one fine tip paintbrush. <laughs> I would then put the insects I collected on from the outside of the plant or just any part of the plant into a vial of alcohol. And when then I'd get to the spathe. And with the spathe, I would generally lift up the hood and look in and collect anything I saw. But even if I didn't see anything in the spathe, I'd usually sweep around in there anyways, because the spathe is pretty poorly lit. And there were generally some small insects I collected. So sweeping around the spathe was generally just to be safe. And then I'd put whatever I caught uh, whatever I collected from the spathe inside a vial of alcohol, when then the vials of alcohol were labeled with locale, date, collector, and any other important information. And finally, at the end of each collection season, I would identify specimens to family. And there were a couple of cases where there were some specimens that were actually ID to species or genus, which this uh, unidentified, undescribed species of aphids. There was um, one aphid, Mises persici, that was collected off the plant. And the specialist thrips, which are heterothrips erysemi, that are known to host on the plant. And the image on the left is of Dr. Damsky showing me how to collect in my first year. And the image on the right is of a crane fly kind of just sitting on the outside of a Jack in the Pulpit spathe. And this is a pretty obvious example of why you look on the outside of the plant because you might see something. And I'm sure people wouldn't miss this. But when there's something smaller on the stem of the plant, it's just really important to make sure to look before just going straight for the spathe. And so here's a graph of the insect families I collected over the three years. And this data closely approximates a species accumulation curve. And in this case, I'm going to call it a family accumulation curve because I only really identified down to family for the most part. And so what this family accumulation curve is, is that no matter what you're collecting, where you're collecting or how you're collecting, you will get a data curve that is similar to this. And that's because you will have your main associations with whatever you're collecting. And then you'll have all these other one-offs and two-offs that you'll collect only maybe once to three times and you're just not gonna see them much anymore. And so in this kind of curve, the least amount of families are represented by the greatest number of specimens collected. And as you can see is the case with the top three families, Mycetophility, Sciaridae, and Psychotidae, there's a huge, they pretty much represent almost the entirety of the collection. 
And then when you go down to the back, the, <clears throat> the most amount of specimen or the most amount of families are represented by the least amount of specimens collected. And while there's all these families at the back here, they only represent a small portion of the collection. And so here's actually the same data, just organized slightly differently. And it's organized by order. And within each order, it's from families from most numerous collected to least numerous collected. And I'll be discussing this through from left to right, starting with diptera. And so out of all the diptera and families I collected, which made up the majority of my collection, the top seven families, or the most numerous seven families collected were all of the suborder Nematostera, with only three families of this order not being, or with only three families collected being Diptera not being in the suborder Nematostera, which were Dolicopodidae, Anthomyidae, and Impididae. Everything else was of Nematostera, and Nematostera was really the overwhelming majority, which I mean, at least at Mount Briar here, this shows that Nematostera are the main association compared to anything else I collected. Then when we can go down to Hemiptera, we have Alirodi, which are the white flies. And to my knowledge, white flies have not previously been observed on the Jack and the Pulpit plant. However, I only collected them in my second year of collection, and I only collected around seven specimens, but it is still interesting nonetheless. And then we go to aphidae, which, as I mentioned earlier, three species of aphids were collected from the jack and the pulpit plant, two of them being undescribed and one of them being described. And I'll actually discuss more about the aphids in a later slide. Cicadelidae, which are uh, the leafhoppers. And every cicadelid I found was kind of stuck in the spathe and it was dead. So that's interesting. And there's psyllidae, myridae, and riparachromidae, which are all uh, plant feeding hemipterans. And finally, in the hemiptera, in hemiptera, there's nabidae and retiviidae, which are predatory hemipterans. And there were also some coleoptera collected, which there was scolididae, the bark beetles, and bupressidae, the metallic wood boring beetles. And most interesting was lathridae, which are fungus beetles. Lathridae feed on fungus. And the jack in the pulpit plant has been cited by previous studies to have um, to emit a slight fungal odor, which is very interesting seeing as how a uh, specimen of Lathridae was collected. Even though only one specimen was collected, it is still an interesting observation. And then going to Hymenoptera and the other orders that I only collected one or two specimens of, there is Braconidae, which are uh, parasitoid wasps, and Formicidae, which are the ants. And then we go to Thripidae, which is Dysonoptera, and the, all the thrips that I collected were all the specialist thrips, heterothrips here, erisimi, which they all, that species of thrips hosts on the jack in the pulpit plant. And a previous study done by Dr. Elka Feller actually, and that was conducted at um, Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, CERC, had actually uh, found that at least at CERC, the thrips were the main association and pollinator of Jack in the pulpit, which is interesting because the inverse is true here, where I collected almost no Thysinoptera, but the amount of Nematostera I collected was really overwhelming. And then there's Psychidae, which are the bagworms. That's the only family of Lepidoptera I collected. And the only specimen of Psychidae I collected was, uh, had made its bag inside or attached its bag inside the spathe of a Jack in the pulpit plant. And then there's uh, Tetrigidae, which is the pygmy grasshoppers. I only collected one Tetrigid, which was stuck in the spathe and was very hard to get out. So I assume that it wasn't there voluntarily. And so here's a pie chart of the orders I collected over the three years with Diptera, and keep in mind it's mainly Nematostera that made up Diptera, being overwhelming with making up over 90% of the collection with the next greatest category being Hemiptera at only about 5%. And then Thysinoptera making up around 2.5% and the rest of the orders making up around 1% or less. 
And so here's just another bar graph showing, comparing the amount of nematostera collected to Thysanoptera to every other specimen from another order. And there are 441 specimens of nematostera collected, thir only 13 specimens of Thysanoptera collected. And then there were only 57 specimens from every other order collected, which this is just an overwhelming majority and really nothing else was collected in as great as numbers as nematostera. Oops. And so here are just some images of some of the families I collected. And these are ordered from, are generally ordered from most numerous to least numerous. And so we start with mycetophility and sciority, which these two families are actually thought to go to the jack and pulpit plant because of the slight fungal odor it emits as these guys are generally attracted to that kind of thing. And then there's psychotity, which are the drain flies. And this is kind of the headless and abdomenless psychotid. I, I have this picture because I liked how it showed the wings and it's generally kind of missing everything else though. And then we have the coronamids, midges. And I collected these guys consistently throughout my three years of collection. Ceratopogonidae and Blepharoceridae. And then we have Thirpidae. And this is an image of the specialist, of some of the specialist thrips I collected. And these guys are small. They're no greater than a millimeter or two. And their wings are fringed, as you can see, which they, with all this, they can only fly about a meter at a time. And because they host on the jack in the pulpit plant, they, and they can only fly about a meter and they're pretty small, they seem, they would probably thrive in densely packed jack in the pulpit clusters. And interestingly enough, I actually, while I barely found any at Mount Briar, one of my original collection sites at Treville, I had observed a immense number of thrips within the jack and pulpit colonies. I saw hundreds, if not thousands of thrips when I first went to Treville. And the only real difference I noticed between Treville and Mount Briar was the density of the jack and the pulpit colonies. At Treville, jack and the pulpit colonies were very tightly packed and very dense which would be an ideal environment for these thrips as in their early instars, they feed on the jack in the pulpit uh, plant parts. And as adults, they feed on the pollen of the jack in the pulpit plant. So they generally need jack in the pulpit plants to be in close vicinity to each other. Whereas the nematocera would do a lot better where the class, where the jack in the pulpit colonies are more spread out because they have functional wings and they're generally larger than the Dysonoptera, so they can fly greater distances. And that could be the reason why Dysonoptera just weren't really present at Mount Briar, but this is uh, speculation on my part. And so now we have Dolicopodi, which are the long-legged flies. And the amount of Dolicopodids I collected during my three years might have been influenced by the large number of ambient dolicopodids I noticed. There were a lot of dolicopodi at this site and I noticed them in a lot, like just kind of everywhere, but uh, they could also be an association. I, this is also just speculation on my part. Then we have topulidae, which are the crane flies. I'm sure everybody here has seen a crane fly. They're big and kind of bumbly and they wouldn't, they don't do well in closed spaces such as a spathe. And I'm, I, a, I feel that the uh, cream flies I collected from inside the spathe, I only collected one or two, were likely there by uh, coincidence and not there purposefully. Similarly, cicadelity with the leafhoppers, I only collected them inside the spathe, dead, and firmly lodged in there. Then we have impidity, which are the dance flies. I did not collect very many impidids. And finally, we have uh, the Calembola, Entomobridae, and Smintheridae. These are kind of the reason why I swept around inside the spathe, even if I couldn't see anything, because I'm pretty confident I wouldn't have seen these guys. They are very small. They're probably a millimeter or less in length. 
And I, while I didn't collect very many of them, it is still an interesting uh, collection nonetheless. And so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the aphids. I found aphids on both the stem and corm of the plant. And there were two undescribed species found in the genera Ropalosiphum and Pemphigus. The one described species that was found was collected from the stem, which was Mises persicae. Mises persicae is also known as the green peach aphid and is a known pest on many crops, but has not been previously observed on the jack in the pulpit plant. And aphids were identified by Dr. Gary Miller of the Beltsville Agriculture Research Center. And so the image on the right is of the winged form of Mises persicae. And here we have both the wingless and winged forms of the Ropalosiphon species. And I don't know if anybody here has ever seen a bug's life, but the wingless form of the Ropalosiphon species looks a lot like the queen ant's pet aphid. And I thought that was a funny coincidence. But on a more serious note, the Ropalosiphon species was only collected in, as individuals. They were never collected in groups of two or more. And the previous collectors of Rapalosiphum had actually only found or only collected them from inside the spathe of the plant, whereas I collected them from inside of the spathe as well as on the outside of the plant on the stem. And then we have the wingless form of the Pemphigus species, and only the wingless form of the Pemphigus species was collected off the corm. And it's a little bit hard to see here, but the Pemphigus aphids are clustered at the top of the corm, which is an enlarged image is kind of here to better see them. And the reason why they're clustered like that is because these guys are negatively phototrophic, which means they're very sensitive to light and they will congregate towards the area with the least amount of light, which is why they're kind of all at the top of the corm here. And so I also collected some predators over my, the course of my study, which mainly consisted of spiders and hemiptera. In my first year of collection, there was an immature assassin bug on the hood of the spathe, which I presume was hunting. And over the course of my study, I noticed that there were many spiders that uh, utilized different parts of the jack in the pulpit plant differently, such as some spiders made webs in the hood of the spathe, as denoted by the arrow. Oops, I'm sorry about that. Some spiders would make a really messy web inside of the spathe which have seemed pretty effective in collecting anything that flew in the spathe. And it was also very effective for me because I got to collect anything that went in the spathe. I'm assuming much the disappointment of the spider that made the web. And then there were some spiders that would sit inside the spathe and kind of just uh, wait for its next meal to come in like this guy on the left. And then there were some spiders that would kind of just be on the outside of the plant on the leaves or on the stem, such as the spider on the right, which is trying to drag a fly that's much too big for it. And so in conclusion, at Mount, and so for conclusions, at Mount Briar, a wide variety of insect families visited the jack in the pulpit plants. However, only a few families really appeared to show strong associations with the plant, which were mainly, which were actually only from the suborder Nematocera. And if pollination is occurring at Mount Briar, then it's more than likely occurring by Nematocera. And I don't have any direct evidence of this, and I only have indirect evidence, which is the number of nematocera I collected. But if the nematocera is the only uh, family or the only group that I collected in such great numbers that could facilitate pollination, everything else I collected was of much smaller numbers, and there were much less specimens in general, and I don't really foresee those. Uh, facilitating pollination for the entire site. And finally, if pollination just is not occurring in Mount Briar, this could be the mechanism for the evolution of cloning in Jack in the Pulpit plants. And this is because Jack in the Pulpit is generally very pretty inefficient when it comes to pollination. And it could have developed cloning to help offset the issues that arose from the cross pollination of plants. And so finally, I would like to acknowledge the Maryland Entomological Society for giving me this opportunity to present to you all. I really appreciate it. Washington County Parks and Recreation for allowing me to collect a Mount Briar for the course of my study. Dr. David Adamski for mentoring me throughout the study as well as for way before the internship. 
Dan DeRoche for identifying these spiders, Dr. Gary Miller for identifying the aphids, and Dr. Cheryl O'Donnell for identifying the specialist thrips. And so here's just a fun image of Jack and Colt that I found as air acema. And if anybody has any questions, I will do my best to answer them. Well done, Ian. Well done, very nice. Uh, and um, yes, uh, I do have a question. I also like uh, anybody else uh, who has a question, they can go first. Anybody else want to ask a question? Or maybe if I go first, they'll think of their question. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Ian, um, uh, Phil Keen, I, hi. <laughs> um, were you by any chance able to identify to species the buprested beetle that you found? Um, no, uh, we did not get to identify that to species. How about to genus? Uh, not to genus either. <laughs> I'm just what curious. It, what did it look like? <laughs> uh, I actually can't recall that off the top of my head. Okay. I, I was just curious. I sort of have a, a, a more than passing interest in coleoptera. <laughs> um, and uh, certainly uh, some buprestids are known to... Uh, feed on flowers of mostly, I guess, in search of pollen. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if this was something that might be not necessarily uh, exclusive to uh, the jack and the pulpit plant, but something that might have been attracted to its particular type of pollen. But uh, if you don't know the species, well, I <laughs> guess I'll just have to guess. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, I have a question. Ian, yeah. uh, you worked real hard at uh, your project from year to year. Um, what would you do differently if, you know, uh, you have to do it over again? Uh, I think the main thing I do differently, well, besides collecting, uh, trying to collect more each year, would be to separate out what I collected from male plants versus what I collected from female plants. Because while observationally, I'm sure I collected more, in, more specimens from female plants, just because of the nature of them, uh, I don't have, uh, I did not separate out the data that way. And that's what I would do differently. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so, and Janet. Uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Janet Leiden here. Uh, not a question, a comment. I've been growing Jack in the pulpit in the garden for many years, but I never really knew anything botanically or entomologically about them. So I've really enjoyed it from that perspective. Thank you. I've been thinking about growing Jack in the pulpit, so that's uh, very interesting. <laughs> They're not easy to grow. I've had a lot of failures. <laughs> so, Ian, mm -hmm. when you um, mentioned the flower, the spathe, and you said that, you know, there's male and there's a female and that uh, females can revert back to male and it's nutrient associated kind of thing. And then you mentioned that there's some flowers that have both male and female parts, right? Uh, what I meant by that was some plants because it's not just uh, one flower on the plant at so at the base of the if like this was the spadix like my hand here there uh -huh. flowers all over the base and so it's not just one but it's a lot of flowers and some yeah. plants would have both some plants would have male and female flowers 
Right. Yeah, I understand that. And um, your pictures, by the way, are really good. Your diagrams that show all the little flowers on the spades and on, on the, um, now what's the middle part called again? The um, spadix. Spadix. And my question is this, though. Mm -hmm. For the ones that have both male and female flowers, right? Mm -hmm. What about the spathe? Because you said the males, the spathe has a hole in it at the base that insects can escape from and leave and carry pollen with them. What mm -hmm. about the ones that have both, the male and the female parts? What is that spathe like? Is that going to have a hole in it? Or so not? that's actually a really good question. I would <laughs> assume, I can't, um, say this for 100%, but I think that the, the uh, gender of the plant generally leans towards the flower that holds the majority on the uh, spate at the base of the spadix. So if you had like 95% male flowers and maybe a couple of female flowers, I think that it leans towards being a male and would likely have the whole. but I'm not I'm going to look for these. <laughs> I have them around here where I live. They're in the back. My uh, property goes into the woods. I have a natural wooded hillside above the east branch of the Patapsco River. And there's a lot of Jack in the pulpit back in here. So uh, I really enjoyed your presentation and it intrigues me now enough that in the spring when they start coming up, I'm going to go look close at them and see what I can find. And, you know, now that I know the difference between the flowers and all that. So I um, appreciate your presentation and uh, you did a really nice study, very comprehensive. So you're to be congratulated on that and uh, well done. And I encourage you to keep up this interest in, uh, in your work, okay? Thank you very much. Definitely. And you have a good mentor too, and Dr. Adamski. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. It was a very nice presentation. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time to listen to it. Thank you. There we go. All right. So, um, do you think you'll be doing any more studies? in the near future, uh, entomology related studies, because I know you're doing environmental science at school. You think you'd want to carry on and do some more stuff with entomology? Uh, I, I definitely would like to. I definitely enjoy uh, conducting these studies. Good. There's always plenty to do, that's for sure. <laughs> plenty. Ian, this is Dave Webb. I have a question for you. Um, there, there's a similar jack in the pulpit, the uh, small jack in the pulpit. I believe the specific epithet on that is fusillum. Did yes. you cross any of that, or are you, and are you aware of uh, similarities in the types of uh, insects attracted to that species as well? So, um, I. So I am aware of um, Pacillium, and I'm not entirely sure if it's recognized as its own species now, because I remember the information I found when I started the study was that it was considered a subspecies to my knowledge. But uh, as for identification of it, I never, I don't think I actually uh, ever really paid attention at my site to if it was um, the subspecies or if it was Pacillium or not. And I actually don't know if there's differences in insects that are associated with psyllium compared to um, regular erysema trifilum. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any ideas, Ian? Um why such a great number of dipterans and a small number of other orders? 
the, uh, is there something in there that you think attracts the flies more? Apparently it must be something like that, right? Uh, I know previous studies have cited um, at least the fungus gnats to be attracted to the uh, plant because of the slight fungal odor it emits. And it right. could be that there are, that extends to other families uh, of nematostra, <laughs> but I am not entirely sure if that is what we're truly attracts them or if they go to the plant for a different reason. Okay. Hey, Ian, this learn. is the uh, Leatherman family. I want to thank you for inviting us to uh, watch your presentation. I thought you did a very good job. And just wanted to say, go big head. <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate you coming to listen to me. So these are some friends, huh? I see the names Paul and Wally Leatherman. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, OK. Glad you guys could join us tonight. Thank you. It's a very thrilling interview. I was very, very enwrapped with what he had to say. I was very interested with it. You know, my yeah. parents' farm, dairy farm over in Damascus, Maryland, we have them things growing everywhere, but we call them preachers in the pulpit. But the jack in the pulpit huh. grows all over their farm. Fantastic never presentation. Look at one the same. <laughs> Go ahead, Buck. I'm sorry. You are. No, I was just going to say f fantastic presentation. Uh, okay. yeah. Also a friend, I suppose. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Great. Brother well, to you. Wally. Oh, okay, great. Does anybody else have any comments or anything they'd like to say to Ian? Just that he, he did a great job. Oh, yeah. We should give him a round of applause. Yay. I will unmute myself for that, certainly. There we go. <laughs> All right, Ian, I hope that um, you'll come back and join us again um, in the future. And as um, Gene Scarpilla mentioned before, you'll be receiving our journal. And uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy looking through that. And um, uh, don't hesitate to join us for uh, Zoom meetings. You do have an honorary membership for a year as well. And um, we hope that you'll attend some meetings as much as you can. Um, I should ask you, are you collecting insects for your own stuff? You have a personal collection because many of us do. I didn't know if you have one too. Uh, I do have a personal collection. It's uh, kind of small at the moment, but it I do have a personal collection. And what group are you looking at? Uh, I'm kind of just collecting everything that I uh, have come across generally. So generally out of my backyard too. So well, that's good. That's how we all started. And now it's out of control. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but good. I hope you keep up your interest in that. You know, um, it's um, something I started when I was a little kid, just start swinging the net around and collecting things. But, um, you know, and um, uh, Phil is also an avid collector and so is uh, Ed, Ed Cohen and others here. So, you know, it starts out small, but then it can become huge depending on what you want to do and how vigorous you want to collect, so, but keep it up. That's good. All right, well, um, if there's no other questions, um, I would uh, like that uh, the MES members, uh, we might, uh, do with just a short little business meeting. And um, the other folks, if, if they wish to stay, they can. If they would like to log out, they're welcome 
to log out. I do see some folks that I'm curious. I see Marion Bundens. Hi, Marion. How are you? Are you also a friend? I'm actually Ian's mom. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm a little All biased. Right. Oh, that's okay. That's good. Um, and actually, um, Dr. Damsky was a mentor for me early on before Ian was born. I, I took a course for him for insects of the uh, moths of the Washington area uh -huh. and volunteered for him for a while. And, um, and then Ian was born and he mentored Ian. So I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Damsky. How about that? Totally welcome. Well, David if he, if he doesn't history. have one yet, <laughs> if he doesn't have one yet, get him a blacklight for Christmas. Oh, yeah, he's got one. <laughs> he blacklight, blacklight's in the backyard. Very <laughs> good. <laughs> and the other gentleman over on the right-hand side on my screen, the, the name on the screen is Laura Miller, but... Um, are you also a friend or family? Well, this is, I'm Randy Miller. And I was, um, I started with the uh, Young Entomologist Program 10 years ago or so when we started, uh, my daughter did uh, as well. And so I've, and I worked for the Smithsonian for, you know, the insect zoo for years. So I'm a friend of Dr. Adamski's and I know many of the people here that we're speaking of. And I wanted to, I wanted to see Ian, Ian's, um, uh, pr uh, presentation, which was just wonderful and very enlightening. I appreciate you doing that, Ian. Thank and, you. Uh, Randy, thank tell them where joining. you're plugged in from. What, what did you say, Dave? Tell them where you're plugged in from. Oh, uh, we live in Gig Harbor, Washington now. We moved from Fairfax, Virginia. And um, so we live in, we're in the Pacific Northwest. We're about um, 45 minutes south of Seattle. Wow. So actually, you set the record for us. You're the furthest away of anybody. We had one from Montana some months ago. <laughs> so you're the new record from Washington State. All right. That's great. Don't you love technology when it works? Yes, especially when it works. Yes, that's when great. it works. <laughs> cool. Wow. Well, Dave, I didn't know you had such a history here of... Uh, <laughs> going back some years here with a few folks and doing all this stuff. So uh, we're indebted to you for <laughs> promoting this hobby and profession of ours. The entomology is, uh, as, you, as it, uh, you've done so many, uh, in so, so much over the years. I had no idea. So I'm impressed <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, I really don't like to think about it because uh, I start feeling old. <laughs> if it's any consolation, Dave, I've been a uh, president of MES for over, for 20 years now. So does that make you feel a little better? <laughs> well, I don't know if I feel better, but uh, <laughs> it's been a while, but it's been a nice ride so far. Yeah. It has. I remember uh, when I first presented for uh, the uh, society uh, many years ago, and you took me into your private collection and showed me the specimens and things. Uh, I was very impressed. And it's probably, as you said before, out of hand now. Out of hand, yeah. <laughs> Two, two rooms, two rooms in the house now. <laughs> but uh, it keeps me, uh, keeps me straight though, you know, and it makes fun for traveling. When I travel, I pursue this a lot. So um, it, uh, there's, there's a lot of travel stories associated with it too. So anyway. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you also, Marion. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, David. Thanks once again. And we'll be in touch, of course. And um, my thanks also to all the other folks who came tonight and attended. And um, Randy from Washington. <laughs> Hope you're doing well out there. 
it's getting cold up there now, I'm sure, right? Well, so. it's a little bit, there's been some rain. Um, there's been flooding up in uh, British Columbia recently, and they've yeah. closed off a lot of things in Vancouver. But we've, we've kind of bypassed that. Um, it's been <laughs> wet, but it hasn't been flooding here in our area quite yet. Um, but we've, we've had our share. Um, so, you know, the passes are now getting snow like around in around Mount, Mount Rainier and Mount Baker. So it's the Cascades are starting to get some, some um, well needed precipitation. So, yeah, I'll it's good stay. Thing. It's a good thing. Yes. Yes. How about <laughs> California? Are they getting some precipitation there too, finally? A little bit, but now they're, yeah, they're getting some landslides and some other things. But I'm, I'm kind of more focused on the Pacific Northwest as opposed to Southern California, but I, I understand. <laughs> yeah. It's great, it's great. It's just, a, it's a wonderful area, it's a, place, a wonderful place to visit and um, we're retiring here. So it's, it's uh, hopefully it'll stay relatively, you know, um, wildfire free and so forth. So we'll see. Hope so. Yeah. Definitely. Well, all right. Um, well, th thanks again, Ian. It's already interrupt, but I'm going to be I'm going to be leaving in this. I have to leave the meeting. But thank you all. Thank you so much, Ian. It was a very good presentation, and I'm sure thank we'll you. be talking soon. And all right, bye now. Take care. Bye. Bye, bye Dave. Okay. So. Um, I suppose for our uh, business meeting, we'll just do the quick things um, and um, maybe we'll start with a report from, from Secretary Janet Leiden. If you have something, Janet, would you share with us? You need to unmute. Just figured that out. <laughs> There you go. Uh, nothing at the moment. Nothing. Okay. I don't know if you had some, something from the minutes from last time or not, but I have not had a chance. I was not present for the lecture and I've not yet had a chance to listen to the recording. Okay. Um, so then, uh, Ed, if you would give us a, a treasurer's update, that would be great. You need to just unmute yourself there, Ed. Hmm. 